everyone, and happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. You know, as the month comes to an end, I and many of my colleagues wanted to take a moment to highlight some of the amazing individuals of AAPI descent who are truly making a difference in Los Angeles today. You'll be hearing stories of hope, challenge, persistence, and courage, stories that reflect the diverse history and experience of the AAPI community. 2020 was a difficult, pain-filled year for the AAPI community, with LA experiencing a 114% increase in anti-AAPI hate crimes. Pandemic scapegoating led to increased violence, attacks, and senseless killings. But through this shared pain, the AAPI community has come together, raising our voices in unison to fight this hate and demand change. The AAPI community has a long history in the US, a history often characterized by exclusion, discrimination, racism, and xenophobia. But despite generations of struggle and adversity, the men and women of the AAPI community, through their contributions, been vital to the growth and prosperity of our nation. And for the next half hour, I invite you to listen to some of these stories of amazing AAPI men and women, because their stories are a part of American history, and our understanding of our nation is truly incomplete without them. I'm here today honoring uh, one of our heroes of the East San Fernando Valley, our senior lead officer, Carol Sawamura, um, who has been a senior lead officer in the North Hollywood Division for uh, the entire time that I've served on the City Council. Carol, welcome. It's great to be able to have uh, a chat with you and uh, to be able to recognize all that you've done in service. First of all, thank you very much Councilmember uh, Krokorian, we have worked together and your staff and I'd just like to take a second for a shout out on that. Can you talk a little bit about what your experience is like uh, as uh, a woman of color and a, a police officer in the city of Los Angeles? In the time of recruitment, um, the LA P uh, Police Department has always, always strived to recruit um, men, women, um, Hispanic, Asian American, African American, and really, really pushed in the whole time that I've been on the job for, you know, uh, to, ha to have diversity within its police department, to be able to represent the city of LA, and as you well know, so diverse in so many different communities and so many languages um, that are represented, and it will it obviously benefited the department to have that representation and to really better serve our community because the relationship is going to be heartfelt mm -hmm. um, that we've reached out that way. I just want to thank you for being such an extraordinary role model for uh, people who, who might not otherwise, might, might otherwise think that they sh would be excluded from this career choice. Nationwide and here in Los Angeles as well, unfortunately, we've seen a really tragic and horrifying rise in hate crimes directed at Asian Americans. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the department is doing to try to address that situation and, and how does that affect you personally? Yes, unfortunately, um, like you said, nationwide and especially a few cities in California, including LA, um, Asian Americans have been unfortunately targeted as victims and it's based on just what they look like um, and just by race and it is difficult to reach sometimes the Asian community um, knowing some victims personally they're very hesitant to maybe reach out and even report something so the one thing um, that the LAPD has really basically done and done recently um, is they made that, that facial recognition of we are the police department and we're here to help you. Uh, many of the um, LAPD supervisors and officers um, basically going face to face with the business people and in the neighborhoods and being open um, transparent 
and um, basically encouraging people to report crimes if they are victims, um, basically offering that support, and making them feel comfortable that it is a police department that is there for them, as well as the rest of the residents of the city. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and honor for me to be able to talk with you today. Well, I thank you too, sir. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our next honoree, Alan Kim. Alan is this year's recipient of the RISE Award for Entertainment. At the age of seven years old, Alan Kim stole our hearts and earned rave reviews for his portrayal of David Yee in Lee Isaac Chung's American epic, Minari. Alan, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for giving me the RISE Award for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. I played the role of David in the Oscar-nominated film, Minari. Minari is about a Korean American family that moves to Arkansas from California to get a better life. The grandma comes and babysits the children while the parents are away. But David didn't like the grandma at first, but does throughout the movie. I'm so proud of being a part of this film because this story is not just a story for a Korean American family. It's a story about all them. I believe if we know each other more, we will be closer friends. I really appreciate Mayor Garcetti, Councilor Member Lee, and everyone for hosting this ceremony. I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Los Angeles Council Member Paul Koretz from the 5th Council District. Today I have the great honor of honoring Vince Wong for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Vince, so happy to see you, my friend, and to honor you here today. I'm so privileged and honored to be um, acknowledged by you in the 5th District in the city. All the things that you've done are so akin to the things that I care about and my office cares about. How did you get interested in, uh, in supporting animals and you know, trying to uh, uh, make their lives uh, better and to reduce cruelty to animals in, in the city and beyond? Yeah, animals are, you know, like I said, such a, an important part of families and an important part of our society. Uh, each individual has, and each family um, has, should have the opportunity, should have the privilege to have a pet as part of their, their family. And it's always been overlooked uh, to this day. Uh, people, many people still consider pets as uh, disp disposable. Uh, they surrender them uh, or abandon them when they no longer feel that uh, they need them in their lives or can support them in their lives. So any opportunity that we can have to keep all families together, they should be considered as part of the family. And we need to be mindful of public policy. We need to be mindful of the decisions we make uh, as a city and as a society and as a family uh, to keep pets together uh, with their families, with the people who love them, and vice versa. I wonder also if you could talk a little bit about uh, volunteering on, on uh, community issues like uh, HIV and AIDS. Civic engagement and being a part of your community outside of yourself and outside of your profession can be a very um, invigorating way to be engaged. So I've had the opportunity um, and, and the time to invest into a lot of causes, including HIV AIDS, including LGBTQ rights, uh, including some human services and social justice issues. Uh, so a plethora of issues that really focus for me on the most underserved uh, populations and those who really could be uplifted by just an external voice or an external ally and provide that, that stability for people who need it the most. Your incredible record of uh, community involvement and support is really unmatched. And it's my honor to uh, have you as my API honor honoree and uh, you know, terrific having you here today. Thank you, council member. And thank you to uh, the city of Los Angeles.
my friend Chansey Martorell, uh, who is here with us, who is the founder and executive director of the Thai CDC. Welcome, and I'm so glad you're here and we're able to do this. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, and I feel so honored. I think when I think of you, Chansey, I think of your, your defining role in helping hundreds, if not thousands, of Thai victims of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Uh, the difference you've made has been profound. Talk about elevating issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a champion in that arena. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little, a little bit yeah. about your experience there? Sure. It's, it's really sad that our um, Thai community is disproportionately affected by this heinous crime or this scourge uh, known as human trafficking and modern day slavery. In fact, a year after our founding, uh, in 1995, just a year after our founding, uh, we um, were uh, uh, hit with this major human trafficking case uh, that fell on our lap and, and uh, we were part of the uh, multi-government agency raid that uh, liberated the Thai men and women who had been trafficked here uh, to, to uh, work in a forced labor situation, a clandestine makeshift garment factory uh, in El Monte, California. So that case, the El Monte Thai Garment Slavery case, became known as uh, the first case of modern day slavery in the United States since we abolished slavery in the 1860s. And, uh, and Thai CDC uh, was um, there to not only help the workers overcome the trauma of their experience, but uh, help them with emergency relief and, and housing and food and clothing, but then also uh, became their advocates to help them pursue justice and assert their rights and gain all the, um, the redress and, and the restitution that they deserved. But it was also just the tip of the iceberg because since that case, until this present day, we have now worked on so many large human trafficking cases involving Thai nationals um, that have been trafficked for the purpose of forced labor uh, or for sexual slavery. And so uh, we have now helped uh, over 2,000 Thais. Unfortunately, it continues to grow unabated. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Can't thank you enough. And it's an honor to have you here today to be your friend, to be your ally, to be your colleague. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. My second guest today in celebration of Asian American Pacific Islander Month uh, uh, is a CD13 resident, uh, Justin Faronda. Humbled to be here. Thank you for uh, choosing uh, myself and um, you know, my restaurant to, uh, to, to celebrate this month with you guys. So here we have an American born here, raised here in the neighborhood that I represent on the city council, historic Filipino town, an incredible community. Uh, people such as yourself reinvesting in the place where you grew up. So what inspired you to open Hi-Fi Kitchen? I, I loved how diverse Los Angeles is, and I loved hanging out in the different ethnic enclaves. Um, you know, when you go to these uh, ethnic enclaves, you know you're in Koreatown. You know when you're in Little Tokyo, Little Ethiopia. But when you come to historic Filipino town, it's not the same. Um, and so, as an adult, so many years later, I was thinking, this is still that way. No one's doesn't seem like anyone's doing anything ab about the visibility of the neighborhood. Um, and that's why I named my restaurant after the neighborhood, Hi-Fi, Historic Filipino Town, the first two letters of, of each of the words. Uh, that way people can say it, we can be in people's mouths, we can be in people's consciousness. That's great. I mean, so you were born and raised there and you are not only vested in the Filipino identity, but also making sure that the profile and, uh, is elevated. Let's go to something you mentioned earlier, registered nurse. Hmm. You had put that behind you to work to open this restaurant and, and, and pursue your other interests. Then the pandemic hits and your skills are needed. February 22nd, 2020 was our one year anniversary. And about a week and a half later, everything shut down. Right, and so um, 
I would go home and, you know, watch the news and see what's going on. I took a leave from the restaurant for three months um, and, I, you know, I, I went back to the front lines. So everyone who's listening, I'm sitting across from a hero right here because, you know, uh, your story reminds me of when there is an actual war in past our past history and people re-enlist to go to the front lines because they meet the moment. That's what you did. You met this moment and uh, that's, that's what Los Angeles is all about. Uh, today I have the um, privilege of interviewing Munson. I've known him for decades through our work uh, and he's been a a mentor and an advisor on uh, all matters related to the uh, API community and particularly with a focus uh, in Chinatown. Uh, he was one of the few who brought us to the Chinese Museum. Uh, he's headed almost every organization in Chinatown, the Chinese Citizen Alliance, the Chinese Historical Society, uh, the Chinese Benevolent Consolidated Association, and of course his leadership uh, at the museum, uh, we are here to interview the one and only Munson Kwok. Well, first of all, thank you for the honor. Of course, I don't think I naturally are deserving, but uh, I'm here and uh, I'm happy to answer you. Uh, you know, right now our big issue is neighborhood sustainability. And uh, that's Chinatown. And, you know, Chinatown has been a destination for all of Los Angeles visitors and people who live here. And uh, it's been a challenge because it's been beloved. It's a colorful place, uh, but we're changing. Months in, we're looking forward coming out of the pandemic. Uh, today, what do you see as uh, your ultimate goal? Uh, what's your vision? Coming out of the pandemic, I think probably to make culture one of the centerpieces and emphases together with economic vitality will uh, bring Los Angeles back to a uh, uh, better social and cultural uh, center for, the, for uh, America than it ever has been. And we appreciate that you're gonna make that effort uh, to emphasize the uh, culture and the history of the neighborhoods especially in a downtown area, which is the oldest part of Los Angeles. Munson, let me uh, say from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you for your friendship, your mentorship, and most of all, your leadership. Thank you, Councilman. I uh, appreciate again the honor. Charlene is a West Hills resident and an immigration attorney who is using the law to help some of our most vulnerable residents of our immigrant community. Welcome, Charlene. Thank you, Council Member John. You know, through your work as an immigration lawyer, I'm sure you've heard about a lot of instances where people, uh, be because of the de their desperation or the situations they're in, falling victim to, you know, scams or uh, misleading campaigns. So. Talk to me about how we can better educate, you know, our community and people who are going through that type of experience. Unfortunately, that's a reality in, in our community. A lot of people are getting taken advantage of, specifically a lot of people who are wanting to be reunited with their family. The immigration, the bedrock, the core is family reunification. So the older generations are trying to figure out how am I going to bring in my children to the United States and typically due to lack of information or due to lack to access they fall victim to people mm -hmm. who are pretty much just preying on their nativity mm -hmm. on their lack of information the, the lack of being able to communicate with someone and, and get good information about this scenario you touched on it a little but what really, what, what does celebrating this month mean for you? Yes, Asi Asian Pacific American Heritage Month for me is a time where we educate, where we make that awareness to other members of the community, AAPI, non-AAPI, to let them know that we are part of this great story of the United States. Mm -hmm. I always say this, 
every small ripple of every single group of the AAPI community can cause a big wave and big impact to the United States as a whole. It's not only important for people of Asian descent to learn about AAPI history, but it's important for everyone to learn about the sort of experience uh, yes. that we've all gone through. How do you hope to sort of broaden that for people and get that out there? Y yes, yes, I completely agree. Asian American Pacific Islander history is not just for our community, it is for everybody. The history of the United States is continuously getting weaved and we are part of that thread to make the whole. So our experience should be known to, to everybody, to the United States as a whole, and one step that is getting us towards that direction is by mandating the ethnic studies courses over at universities and, and state colleges. So that's one good thing. The Asian Pacific American Heritage Month is a very good program and a very good uh, celebration of our history, our accomplishments, our experiences. Thank you on behalf of the immigrant communities for everything that you're doing uh, to help them out. Thank you so much for that and I'm just so happy that we can spotlight you as a guest during Asian Pacific Heritage And thank you so Month. much for this, Council Member John. This is a big thing for the community, not just for CD12, but for yes. our voices to be heard. Thank you for giving us this avenue. Thank, thank you, you, Charlie. Thank you. Well, Corinne, it is great to see you here. Uh, you are such an important part of the West San Fernando Valley uh, community. You've been involved in so many organizations. Maybe you could tell, tell me a little bit about the work that you do. I started off by uh, serving on the Neighborhood Council of, of Canoga Park for nine years, weighing in on different issues that sometimes we don't necessarily choose, but have to. Um, I'm thinking about weighing in on the LA River Master Plan. I know you've done a lot with uh, homelessness. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you've done around homelessness? Yes, uh, in terms of the work that I did for, I did for homelessness, I started again in Canoga Park helping people on the street and, and uh, trying to connect them to services and realize at some point that there was very limited work I could do. So I did work um, momentarily for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, known as LASA as well and uh, doing outreach and really make a difference in the lives of folks on the street. I, I've always admired the fact that you look at the big picture stuff, you're, you're trying to advocate on some of the Triple H issues and some of the policy, but you're also very hands-on. I mean, I've been out there on the streets with you uh, in the past, going, talking to uh, homeless folks who are in encampments, trying to guide them toward services and, and making sure they're aware of everything that's, that's going on. and, and uh, I always appreciate that that your your passion extends not just to the policy, but to really to the hands-on work that you do. Uh, today, we're going to close out this program by uh, talking to some of our youth. I'm proud to uh, be joined by two alums of uh, the uh, leadership program that we have in Council District 12. Miguel Datok and Alyssa Park, welcome you guys. I'm sure you've heard many stories in the news over the last uh, year about the unfortunate violent attacks that have uh, uh, been targeted against members of the AAPI community. How have the, the events of last year or hearing these stories, how have they affected you? Miguel, we'll start with you. So it was very disheartening and very saddening to hear about the stories that have happened in the past few months. But um, in terms of how it affected me and my family, uh, I think that it hasn't affected our perspective on um, our general safety and well-being here in the United States. And so um, despite the attacks, we don't let it um, control us and we don't let it develop a fear into our mindset. And so we believe that um, although there are like a few uh, discriminatory and racist individuals in the United States, it's not representative of the overall culture and the overall population. Alyssa, how about you? I was also disheartening for me, but opposite of what Miguel was saying, I'm actually a little more scared because I'm one 
a kind of petite girl, so I was always scared before that, like I was gonna get attacked anyways. But now on top of that, I'm Asian, and also I'm like in the target demographic of um, Asian hate crimes, Asian American <laughs> hate crimes. Mm -hmm. So in the back of my mind, whenever I'm like walking my dog or like I pass by somebody, I'm just like, they're not gonna hate crime me, right? Mm -hmm. that, I don't like thinking like that, but it just like comes across my mind every single time. No, I mean, it's tough. Like, you, you know, when we've seen the attacks on some of our elderly, mm -hmm. you know, even my mom, I don't know what to tell her when she says she's like, she's honestly, you know, afraid to, yeah. and it's sad because, you know, I, 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 I don't know how to reassure her. How familiar are you with AAPI history in America? Uh, and, and do you think we learn enough of it? Uh, sadly, I don't know too much about it in America because I literally learned from my sister who was in college and chose to take like an Asian American class and I definitely think that we should learn more about it because there's so many Asian people here and there, there's so much like rich history and I feel like people will come to understand Asian Americans even more if we learn more about the history. And I can't say that I know as much either about um, American, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander um, culture here in uh, history. I should say, um, in the United States. And I definitely think that um, we should implement, um, we should teach kids more about the different contributions that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have made in this country. As both of you, uh, you know, delve more into the history, you guys are gonna learn about some amazing stories and just a, just a real part of, you know, of how we, you know, help build this country and the contributions that Asian Americans have uh, made to it. I agree with both of you. Uh, we just, that sort of gets glossed over, mm -hmm. you know, when we learn about our, our history. And Asian Americans play an important part of that history and we need to, we all need to learn more about that. Both of you, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to have you guys as former, you know, CD12 leadership class and I know you guys are going on to do uh, great things in the future. So I appreciate you both being with us here today. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Six women were among the victims of a horrific shooting in Georgia. They were killed because they were Asian. But anti-Asian violence is not new. It is part of our collective memory. As the families in Georgia mourn and memorialize the lives of their loved ones, we remember the history of racism our community has faced. In 1875, the Page Act passes banning Chinese women from entering the United States. It's the first federal law to limit immigration. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act passes, prohibiting Asian immigrants from becoming U.S. citizens. Its discriminatory practices survive for over 80 years. In 1885, 28 Chinese Americans are lynched and murdered in Rock Springs, Wyoming. 1930. Across California, hundreds of Filipino-American farm workers injured and scores killed by rioters. 1942. 120,000 Japanese-Americans incarcerated in concentration camps by our own government. 1982. Vincent Chin beat to death by two men with a baseball bat right before his wedding. Mistaken for being Japanese, accused of stealing their jobs. 1989, five Vietnamese and Cambodian children killed, more than 30 wounded, Stockton, California. In the wake of September 11, 2001, attacks against Muslims and South Asians surge. 2012, six Sikh Americans killed in a temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. This past year, almost 4,000 incidents of anti-Asian violence, including murders of our elders simply walking in their own neighborhoods. Memory is the antidote to death. Solidarity is the answer to silence. As activist Valerie Kaur once asked, what if this is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? Today, we birth something new, knowing it's up to all of us to keep each other safe and shine a light together.